Section 92 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 92. The Story of Yoshitsune by Ye Theodora Ozaki. In old Japan, more than 700 years ago, a fierce war was raging between the two great clans, the Taira and the Minamoto, also called the Heiki and the Genji. These two famous clans were always contesting together for political power and military supremacy, and the country was torn in two with the many bitter battles that were fought. Indeed, it may be said that the history of Japan for many years was the history of these two mighty martial families, sometimes the Minamoto and sometimes the Taira gaining the victory, or being beaten as the case might be, but their swords knew no rest for a period of many years. At last, a strong and valiant general arose in the house of Minamoto. His name was Yoshitomo. At this time, there were two aspirants for the imperial throne, and civil war was raging in the capital. One imperial candidate was supported by the Taira, the other by the Minamoto. Yoshitomo, though a Minamoto, sided at first with the Taira against the reigning emperor, but when he saw how cruel and relentless their chief Kiyomori was, he turned against him and called all his followers to rally round the Minamoto standard and fight to put down the Taira. But fate was against to the gallant and doughty warrior Yoshitomo, and he suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of the Taira. He and his men, while fleeing from the vigilance of their enemies, were overtaken within the city gates and ruthlessly slaughtered by Kiyomori and his soldiers. Yoshitomo left behind him his beautiful young wife, Tokiwa Gozen, and eight children to mourn his untimely death. Five of the elder children were by a first wife. The third of these became Yoritomo, the great first shogun of Japan, while the eighth and youngest child was Ushiwaka, about whom this story is written. Ushiwaka and the hero of Yoshitsune were one and the same person. Ushiwaka, young ox, he was so called because of his wonderful strength, was his name as a boy, and Yoshitsune was the name he took when he became of age. At the time of his father's death, Ushiwaka was a babe in the arms of his mother, Tokiwa Gozen, but his tender age would not have saved his life had he been found by his father's enemies. After the defeat they had inflicted on the rival clan, the Taira were all-powerful for a time. The Minamoto clan were in dire straits, and in danger of being exterminated now, for so fierce was Kiyomori's hatred against his enemies, that when a Minamoto fell into his cruel hands, he immediately put the captive to death. Realizing the great peril of the situation, Tokiwa Gozen, the widow of Yoshitomo, full of fear and anxiety for the safety of her little ones, quietly hid herself in the country, taking with her Ushiwaka and her two other children. So successful was Tokiwa Gozen in concealing her hiding place that though the Taira clan either killed or banished to a faraway island all the elder sons, relations and partisans of the Minamoto chief, they could not discover the whereabouts of the mother and her children, notwithstanding the strict search Kiyomori had made. Determined to have his will, and angry at being thwarted by a woman, Kiyomori at last hit on a plan which he felt sure would not fail to draw the wife of Yoshitomo from her hiding place. He gave orders that Sakiya, the mother of the fair Tokiwa, should be seized and brought before him. He told her sternly that if she would reveal her daughter's hiding place, she would be well treated, but if she refused to do as she was told, she would be tortured and put to death. When the old lady declared that she did not know where Tokiwa was, as in truth she did not, Kiyomori thrust her into prison and had her treated cruelly day after day. Now, the reason why Kiyomori was so set on finding Tokiwa and her sons was that while Yoshitomo's heirs lived, he and his family could know no safety for the strongest moral law in every Japanese heart was the old command, a man may not live under the same heaven with the murderer of his father, and the Japanese warrior wrecked nothing of life or death, of home or love, in obeying this, as he deemed supreme commandment. Women, too, burned with the same zeal in avenging the wrongs of their fathers and husbands. Tokiwa Gozen, though hiding in the country, heard of what had befallen her mother, 
and great was her sorrow and distress. She sat down on the mats and moaned aloud. It is wrong of me to let my poor innocent mother suffer to save myself and my children. But if I give myself up, Kiyomori will surely take my lord's sons and kill them. What shall I do? Oh, what shall I do? Poor Tokiwa. Her heart was torn between her love for her mother and her love for her children. Her anxiety and distraction were pitiful to see. Finally, she decided that it was impossible for her to remain still and silent under the circumstances. She could not endure the thought that her mother was suffering persecution while she had the power of preventing it. So, holding the infant Ushiwaka in her bosom under her kimono, she took his two elder brothers, one seven and the other five years of age, by the hand and started for the capital. There were no trains in those days, and all traveling by ordinary people had to be done on foot. Daimyos and great and important personages were carried in palanquins, and they only could travel in comfort and in state. Tokiwa could not hope to meet with kindness or hospitality on the way, for she was a Minamoto, and the Taira being all-powerful, it was death to any one to harbor a Minamoto fugitive. So the obstacles that beset Tokiwa were great, but she was a samurai woman, and she quailed not at her duty, however hard or stern that duty was. The greater the difficulties, the higher her courage rose to meet them. At last she set out on her momentous and celebrated journey. It was winter time, and snow lay on the ground, and the wind blew piercingly cold, and the roads were bad. What Tokiwa, a delicately nurtured woman, suffered from cold and fatigue, from loneliness and fear, from anxiety for her little children, from dread lest she should reach the capital too late to save her old mother, who might die under the cruel treatment to which she was being subjected, or be put to death by Kiyomori in his wrath, or finally, lest she herself should be seized by the Taira and her filial plan be frustrated before she could reach the capital. All this must have been greater than any words can tell. Sometimes poor distressed Tokiwa sat down by the wayside to hush the wailing babe she carried in her bosom, or to rest the two little boys who, tired and faint and famished, clung to her robes, crying for their usual rice. On and on she went, soothing and consoling them as best she could, till at last she reached Kyoto, weary, footsore, and almost heartbroken. But though she was well-nigh overcome with physical exhaustion, yet her purpose never flagged. She went at once to the enemy's camp and asked to be admitted to the presence of General Kiyomori. When she was shown into the dread man's presence, she prostrated herself at his feet and said that she had come to give herself up and to release her mother. I am Tokiwa, the widow of Yoshitomo. I have come with my three children to beseech you to spare my mother's life and to set her free. My poor old mother has done nothing wrong. I am guilty of hiding myself and the little ones, yet I pray humbly for your august forgiveness. She pleaded in such an agonizing way that Kiyomori, the Taira chieftain, was struck with admiration for her filial piety, a virtue more highly esteemed than any other in Japan. He felt sincerely sorry for Tokiwa and her woe, and her beauty and her tears melted his hard heart, and he promised her that if she would become his wife, he would spare not only her mother's life, but her three children also. For the sake of saving her children's lives, the sad-hearted woman consented to Kiyomori's proposal. It must have been terrible to her to wed with her lord's enemy, the very man who had caused his death, but the thought that by so doing she saved the lives of his sons, who would one day surely arise to avenge their father's cruel death, must have been her consolation and her recompense for the sacrifice. Kiyomori showed himself kinder to Tokiwa than he had ever shown himself to anyone, for he allowed her to keep the babe Ushiwaka by her side. The two elder boys he sent to a temple to be trained as acolytes under the tutelage of priests. By placing them out of the world in the seclusion of the priesthood, Kiyomori felt that he would have little to fear from them when they attained manhood. How terribly and bitterly he was mistaken, we learn from history. For two of Yoshitomo's sons, banished though they had been for years and years, arose like a rushing, mighty whirlwind from the obscurity of the monastery to avenge their father, and they wiped the Taira from off the face of the earth. Time passed by, and when the little babe Ushiwaka at last reached the age of seven, Kiyomori likewise took him from his mother and sent him to the priests. The sorrow of Tokiwa, bereft of the last child of her beloved lord Yoshitomo, can better be imagined than described. But in her golden captivity, even Kiyomori had not been able to deprive her of one iota of the incomparable power of motherhood, that of influencing the life of her child to the end of his days. 
as the little fellow had lain in her arms night and day, as she crooned him to sleep and taught him to walk, she forever whispered the name of Minamoto Yoshitomo in his ear. At last one day her patience was rewarded, and Ushiwaka lisped his father's name correctly. Then Tokiwa clasped him proudly to her breast and wept tears of thankfulness and joy, and of sorrowing remembrance, for she never could even for a day banish Yoshitomo from her mind. As Ushiwaka grew older and could understand better what she said, Tokiwa would daily whisper, Remember thy father, Minamoto Yoshitomo. Grow strong and avenge his death, for he died at the hands of the Taira. And day by day she told him stories of his great and good father, of his martial prowess in battle, and of his great strength and wonderful wielding of the sword, and she bade her little son remember and be like his father. And the mother's words and tears, sown in the long years of patience and bitter endurance, bore fruit beyond all she had ever hoped or dreamed. So Ushiwaka was taken from his mother at the age of seven, and was sent to the Tokobo Monastery at Kuramayama to be trained as a monk. Even at that early age he showed great intelligence, read the sacred books with avidity, and surprised the priests by his diligence and quickness of memory. He was naturally a very high-spirited youth, and could brook no control, and hated to yield to others in anything whatsoever. As the years passed by and he grew older, he came to hear from his teachers and school friends of how his father Yoshitomo and his clan, the Minamoto, had been overthrown by the Taira, and this filled him with such intense sorrow and bitterness that sleeping or waking he could never banish the subject from his mind. As he listened daily to these things, the words of his mother, which she had whispered in his ear as a child, now came throbbing back to his mind and he understood their full meaning for the first time. In the lonely nights he felt again her hot tears falling on his face, and heard her repeat as clearly as a bell in the silence of the darkness, Remember thy father, Minamoto Yoshitomo, avenge his death, for he died at the hands of the Taira. At last one night the lad dreamt that his mother, beautiful and sad as he remembered her in the days of his childhood, came to his bedside and said to him, while the tears streamed down her face, Avenge thy father, Yoshitomo. Unless thou remember my last words, I cannot rest in my grave. I am dying, Ushiwaka, remember and Ushiwaka awoke as he cried aloud in his agony, I will, honorable mother, I will. From that night his heart burned within him, and the fire and love of clan race stirred his soul. Continual brooding over the wrongs of his clan generated in his heart a fierce desire for revenge, and he finally resolved to abandon the priesthood, become a great general like his father, and punish the Taira. And as his ambition was fired and exalted, and his mind thrilled back to the days when his poor unhappy mother Tokiwa prayed and wept over him, daily whispering in his ear the name of his father, his will grew to purpose strong. Tokiwa had not suffered in vain. From this time on, Ushiwaka bided his time every night, till all in the temple were fast asleep. When he heard the priest snoring and knew himself safe from observation, he would steal out from the temple and making his way down the hillside into the valley, he would draw his wooden sword and practice fencing by himself, and, striking the trees and stones, imagine that they were his Taira foes. As he worked in this way, night after night, he felt his muscles grow strong, and this practice taught him how to wield his sword with skill. One night, as usual, Ushuaka had gone out to the valley, and was diligently brandishing about his wooden sword. His mind, fully bent upon his self-taught lesson, he was marching up and down, chanting snatches of war songs and striking the trees and the rocks, when suddenly a great cloud spread over the heavens, the rain fell, the thunder roared, and the lightning flashed, and a great noise went through the valley as if all the trees were being torn up by the roots and their trunks were splitting. While Ushiwaka wondered what this could mean, a great giant over ten feet in height stood before him. He had large, round, glaring eyes that glinted like metal mirrors. His nose was bright red and it must have been about a foot long. His hands were like the claws of a bird, and to each there were only two fingers. The feathers of long wings at each side peeped from under the creature's robes, and he looked like a gigantic goblin. Fearful indeed was this apparition. But Ushiwaka was a brave and spirited youth and the son of a soldier, and he was not to be daunted by anything. Without moving a muscle of his face, he gripped his sword more tightly and simply asked, Who are you, Sirrah? 
the goblin laughed aloud and said i am the king of the tengu the elves of the mountains and i have made this valley my home for many a long year footnote the tengu are strange creatures with very long noses sometimes they have the head of a hawk and the body of a man end of footnote i have admired your perseverance in coming to this place night after night for the purpose of practicing fencing all by yourself and i have come to meet you with the intention of teaching you all i know of the art of the sword ushiwaka was delighted when he heard this for the tengu have supernatural powers and fortunate indeed are those whom they favor he thanked the giant elf and expressed his readiness to begin at once he then whirled his sword and began to attack the tengu but the elf shifted his position with the quickness of lightning and taking from his belt a fan made of seven feathers parried the showering blows right and left so cleverly that the young knight's interest became thoroughly aroused every night he came out for the lesson he never missed once summer or winter and in this way he learned all the secrets of the art which the tengu could teach him the tengu was a great master and ushiwaka an apt pupil he became so proficient in fencing that he could overcome ten or twenty small tengu in the twinkling of an eye and he acquired extraordinary skill and dexterity in the use of the sword and the tengu also imparted to him the wonderful adroitness and agility which made him so famous in after life now ushiwaka was about fifteen years old a comely youth and tall for his age at this time there lived on mount hei just outside the capital a wild bonze named musashi bo benke who was such a lawless and turbulent fellow that he had become notorious for his deeds of violence the city rang with the stories of his misdeeds and so well known had he become that people could not hear his name without fear and trembling ben k suddenly made up his mind that it would be good sport to steal a thousand swords from various knights no sooner did the wild idea enter his head than he began to put it into practice every night he sauntered forth to the gojo bridge of kyoto and when a knight or any man carrying a sword passed by benkei would snatch the weapon from his girdle if the owners yielded up their blades quietly benkei allowed them to pass unhurt but if not he would strike them dead with a single blow of the huge halberd he carried so great was benkei's strength that he always overcame his victim resistance was useless and night by night one and sometimes two men met death at his hands on the gojo bridge in this way benkei gained such a terrible reputation that everybody far and near feared to meet him and after dark no one dared to pass near the bridge he was known to haunt so fearful were the tales told of the dreaded robber of swords at last this story reached the ears of ushiwaka and he said to himself what an interesting man this must be if it is true that he is a bonze he must be a strange one indeed but as he only robs people of their swords he cannot be a common highwayman if i could make such a strong man a retainer of mine he would be of great assistance to me when i punish my enemies the taira clan good to-night i will go to the gojo bridge and try the metal of this benkei ushiwaka being a youth of great courage had no sooner made up his mind to meet benkei than he proceeded to put his plan into execution he started out that same evening it was a beautiful moonlight night and taking with him his favorite flute he strolled forth through the streets of the sleeping city till he came to the gojo bridge then from the opposite direction came a tall figure which appeared to touch the clouds so gigantic was its stature the stranger was clad in a suit of coal-black armor and carried an immense halberd this must be the sword robber he is indeed strong said ushiwaka to himself but he was not in the least daunted and went on playing his flute quite calmly Presently the armed giant halted and gazed at Ushiwaka, but evidently thought him a mere youth and decided to let him go unmolested, for he was about to pass him by without lifting a hand. This indifference on the part of Benkei not only disappointed but angered Ushiwaka. Having waited in vain for the stranger to offer violence, our hero approached Benkei and, with the intention of picking a quarrel, suddenly kicked the latter's halberd out of his hand. Benkei, who first thought to spare Ushiwaka on account of his youth, became very angry when he found himself insulted by a lad to whom he had been intentionally kind in a fury he exclaimed miserable stripling and raising his halberd struck sideways at ushiwaka thinking to slice him in two at the waist and to see his body fall asunder but the young knight nimbly avoided the blow which would have killed him and springing back a few paces he flung his fan at benkei's head and uttered a loud cry of defiance footnote 
the fighter's fan was always made of metal and was often used as a weapon end of footnote the fan struck benkei on the forehead right between the eyes making him mad with pain in a transport of rage benkei aimed a fearful blow at ushiwaka as if he were splitting a log of wood with an axe this time ushiwaka sprang up to the parapet of the bridge clapped his hands and laughed in derision saying here i am don't you see here i am and benkei was again thwarted thus benkei who had never known his strokes to miss before had now failed twice in catching this nimble opponent frantic with chagrin and baffled rage he now rushed furiously to the attack whirling his great halberd round in all directions till it looked like a water wheel in motion striking wildly and blindly at ushiwaka but the young knight had been taught tricks innumerable by the giant tengu of kuramayama and he had profited so well by his lessons that the king tengu had at last said that even he could teach him nothing more and now as it may well be imagined he was too quick for the heavy benkei when benkei struck in front ushiwaka was behind and when benkei aimed a blow behind ushiwaka darted in front nimble as a monkey and swift as a swallow ushiwaka avoided all the blows aimed at him and finding himself outmatched even the redoubtable benkei grew tired ushiwaka saw that benkei was played out he kept up the game a little longer and then changed his tactics seizing his opportunity he knocked benkei's halberd out of his hand when the giant stooped to pick his weapon up ushiwaka ran behind him and with a quick movement tripped him up there lay the big man on all fours while ushiwaka nimbly strode across his back and pressing him down asked him how he liked this kind of play all this time benkei had wondered at the courage of the youth in attacking and challenging a man so much larger than himself but now he was filled with amazement at ushiwaka's wonderful strength and adroitness i am indeed astonished at what you have done said benkei who in the world can you be i have fought with many men on this bridge but you are the first of my antagonists who has displayed such strength are you a god or a tengu you certainly cannot be an ordinary human being ushiwaka laughed and said are you afraid for the first time then i am answered benkei will you from henceforth be my retainer demanded ushiwaka i will in very truth be your retainer but may i know who you are asked benkei meekly ushiwaka now felt sure that benkei was in earnest he therefore allowed him to get up from the ground and then said i have nothing to hide from you i am the youngest son of minamoto yoshitomo and my name is ushiwaka benkei started with surprise when he heard these words and said what is this i hear are you in truth a son of the lord yoshitomo of the minamoto clan that is the reason i felt from the first moment of our encounter that your deeds were not those of a common person no wonder that i thought this i am only too happy to become the retainer of such a distinguished and spirited young knight i will follow you as my lord and master from this very moment if you will allow me i can wish for no greater honor so there and then on the gojo bridge in the silver moonlight the bonze benkei vowed to be the true and faithful vassal of the young knight ushiwaka and to serve him loyally till death and thus was the compact between lord and vassal made from that time on benkei gave up his wild and lawless ways and devoted his life to the service of ushiwaka who was highly pleased at having won such a strong liegeman to his side although ushiwaka had now secured benkei it was impossible for only two men however strong to think of fighting the taira clan so they both decided that the cherished plan must wait until the minamoto were stronger while thus waiting they heard a report to the effect that a descendant of tawara toda hidesato named hidehira was now a famous general in kaiwai of the ashu province and that he was so powerful that no one dared oppose him hearing this ushiwaka thought that it would be a good plan to pay the general a visit and try to interest him if possible in the fortunes of the house of minamoto he consulted with benkei who encouraged the young knight in his scheme of enlisting the general hidehira as a partisan and the two therefore left kyoto secretly and journeyed as quickly as possible to oshu on this errand on the way there ushiwaka and benkei came to the temple of atsuda and as they considered it important that the young knight should look older now ushiwaka performed the ceremony of gembuku at the shrine this was a rite performed in olden times when youth reached the age of manhood they then had to shave off the front part of their hair and to change their names as a sign that they had left childhood behind ushiwaka now took the name of yoshitsune as he was the eighth son it would have been more correct for him to have assumed the name of hachiro but as his uncle tametomo the archer was named hachiro he purposely did not take this name 
From this time forth, our hero is known as Yoshitsune, and this name he is glorified forever by his wonderful bravery and many heroic exploits. In Japanese history, he is the knight without fear and without reproach, the darling of the people, to them almost an incarnation of Hashiman, the popular god of war. As for Benkei, never can you find in all history a vassal who was more true or loyal to his master than Benkei. He was Yoshitsune's right hand in everything, and his strength and wisdom carried them successfully through many a dire emergency. From Kyoto to Oshu is a long journey of about 300 miles. But at length Yoshitsune, as we must now call him, and Benkei reached their destination and craved the general Hidehira's assistance. They found that Hidehira was a warm adherent of the Minamoto cause, and under the late Lord Yoshitomo he and his family had enjoyed great favor. When the general learned, therefore, that Yoshitsune was the son of the illustrious Minamoto chief, his joy knew no bounds, and he made Yoshitsune and Benkei heartily welcome, and treated them both as guests of honor and importance. Just at this time, Yoshitsune's eldest brother, Yoritomo, who had been banished to an island in Izu, collected a great army and raised his standard against the Taira. When the news about Yoritomo reached Yoshitsune, he rejoiced, for he felt that the hour had at last come when the Minamoto would be revenged on the Taira for all the wrongs they had suffered at the hands of the latter. With the help of Hidehira and the faithful Benkei, he collected a small army of warriors and at once marched over to his brother's camp in Itsu. He sent a messenger ahead to inform Yoritomo that his youngest brother, now named Yoshitsune, was coming to aid him in his fight against the Taira. Yoritomo was exceedingly glad at this unexpected good news, for all that helped to swell his forces now brought nearer the day when he would be able to strike his long-planned blow at the power of the hated Taira. As soon as Yoshitsune reached Izu, Yoritomo arranged for an immediate meeting. Although the two men were brothers, it must be remembered that their father had been killed and the family utterly scattered when they were mere children, Yoshitsune being at that time but an infant in his mother's arms. As this was therefore the first time they had met, Yoritomo knew nothing of his younger brother's character. One of Yoshitsune's elder brothers had come with him, and Yoritomo, being a shrewd general, wished to test them both to see of what metal they were made. He ordered his retainers to bring a brass basin full of boiling water. When it was brought, Yoritomo ordered Noriyori, the elder of the two, to carry it to him first. Now brass, being a good conductor of heat, the basin was very hot, and Noriyori stupidly let it fall. Yoritomo ordered it to be filled again, and bade Yoshitsune bring it to him. Without moving a muscle of his handsome face, Yoshitsune took hold of the almost unbearably hot vessel and carried it with due ceremony slowly across the room. This exhibition of nerve and endurance filled Yoritomo with admiration, and he was favorably struck with Yoshitsune's character. As for Noriyori, who had been unable to hold a hot basin for a few moments, he had no use for him at all except as a common soldier. Yoritomo begged Yoshitsune to become his right-hand man and zealously to espouse his cause. Yoshitsune declared that this had been his lifelong ambition ever since he could remember. As they both were sons of the same father, so was their cause and destiny one. Yoritomo made Yoshitsune a general of part of his army, and ordered him in the name of his father Yoshitomo to chastise the Taira. Delighted beyond all words at the wonderfully auspicious turn events were taking, Yoshitsune hastened his preparations for the march. The longed-for hour had come to which, through his whole childhood and youth, he had looked forward, and for which his whole being had thirsted for many years. He could now fulfill the last words of his unhappy mother, and punish the Taira for all the evil they had wrought against the Minamoto, all the wild restlessness of his youth which had driven him forth to wield his wooden sword against rocks in the Kuramayama Valley, and to try his strength against Benkei on the Gojo Bridge, now found vent in action most dear to a born warrior's heart. With several thousands of troops under him, Yoshitsune marched up to Kyoto and waged war against the Taira, and defeated them in a series of brilliant engagements. The stricken Taira multitudes fled before the avenger like autumn leaves before the blast, and Yoshitsune pursued them to the sea. At Dan no Ura, the Taira made a last stand, but all in vain. Their lion leader, Kiyomori, was dead, and there was no great chieftain to rally them in the disordered retreat that now ensued. Yoshitsune came sweeping down upon them, and they and their fleet and their infant emperor likewise, with their women and children, sank beneath the waves. 
only a scattered few lived to tell the tale of the terrible destruction that overtook them on the sea thus did yoshitsune become a great warrior and general thus did he fulfill the ambitions of his youth and avenge his father yoshitomo's death he was without a rival in the whole country for his marvelous bravery and successive victories he was adored by the people as their most popular hero and darling and throughout the length and breadth of the land his praise was sung by everyone end of section ninety two this recording is in the public domain recorded by colleen mcmahon Section 93 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Nima. Three Japanese Poems. Translated by Frederick Victor Dickens. The Pine Tree by Chi Nagon Yukihira. Inoba's lofty range is crowned by many a tall pine tree. Ah, quickly were I homewards bound, if thou shouldst pine for me. The Faded Flower by Kino Tomonori Tis a pleasant day of merry spring, no bitter frost are threatening, no storm winds blow, no rain clouds lower, the sun shines bright on high, yet thou, poor little trembling flower dost wither away and die faithfulness by die nai no sami more fickle thou than the winds that pour down arima or inas moor and still my love for thee as yet i have forgotten to forget End of section 93. This recording is in the public domain. Section 94 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Nikki504. The Great Buddha of Kamakura. Page 318 the gentleness the dreamy passionlessness of those features the immense repose of the whole figure are full of beauty and charm and contrary to all expectation the nearer you approach the giant buddha the greater this charm becomes you look up into the solemnly beautiful face into the closed eyes that seem to watch you through their eyelids of bronze as gently as those of a child and you feel that the image typifies all that is tender and calm in the soul of the east yet you feel that only japanese thought could have created its beauty its dignity its perfect repose reflect the higher life of the race that imagined it and though doubtless inspired by some indian motto as the treatment of the hair and various symbolic marks review the art is japanese so mighty and beautiful the work is that you will not for some time notice the magnificent lotus plants of bronze fully fifteen feet high planted before the figure on either side of the great tripod in which incense rods are burning through an orifice in the right side of the enormous lotus blossom on which the buddha is seated you can enter into the statue the interior contains a little shrine of Quanon and a statue of the priest Yuten, and a stone tablet bearing in Chinese characters the sacred formula Namu Amida Bustu. 
a ladder enables the pilgrim to ascend into the interior of the colossus as high as the shoulders in which are two little windows commanding a wide prospect of the grounds while a priest who acts as guide states the age of the statue to be six hundred and thirty years and asks for some small contribution to aid in the erection of a new temple to shelter it from weather for this buddha once had a temple a tidal wave following an earthquake swept walls and roof away but left the mighty amida unmoved still meditating upon his lotus so lafacadio hearn describes the great buddha of kamakura end of section ninety four this recording is in the public domain recording by nikki five zero four new orleans Section 95 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Avai. Japan, Part 2 The Rule of the Shoguns Historical Note By the 13th century, the supreme power had been largely taken over by the Shogun, or Commander-in-Chief, and the Mikado was little more than a figurehead. Toward the end of the century, the Mongols under Kublai Khan attempted several invasions of Japan, but were repulsed. In the 16th century, Hideyoshi, the shogun of the time, succeeded in getting complete control of the realm and permitted the Mikado no share in the government. His power became supreme, owing chiefly to his wisdom in dividing the fiefs of the daimyos, or nobility, into holdings so small that the owners were powerless against him. In the middle of the 16th century, some Portuguese sailors were wrecked on the Japanese coast, and a little later Mendes Pinto was driven upon the shores of the island kingdom. Japan had no wish for commercial or other intercourse with foreign nations, but now that Portugal had found the way, this could hardly be avoided, and trade with both Portuguese and Dutch followed, though with numerous restrictions. Christianity had been preached in Japan, and many converts had been made. These converts had been so bitterly persecuted that they had joined the Portuguese in a plot to overthrow the government. As a result, the Portuguese were expelled from the country. End of section 95 This recording is in the public domain. Section 96 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The World Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 96. The Great Kan Kubai Invades Japan by Marco Polo. Sipangu, Japan, is an island in the eastern ocean, situated at the distance of about 1,500 miles from the mainland, or coast of Banji. It is of considerable size. Its inhabitants have fair complexions, are well made, and are civilized in their manners. Their religion is the worship of idols. They are independent of every foreign powder, and govern only by their own kings. They have gold in the greatest abundance, its sources being inexhaustible but as the king does not allow its being exported, few merchants visit the country, nor is it frequented by much shipping from other parts. 
to this circumstance we are to attribute the extraordinary richness of the sovereign's palace according to what we are told by those who have access to the place the entire roof is covered with a plating of gold in the same manner as we cover houses or more properly churches with lead the ceiling of the halls are of the same precious metal many of the apartments have small tables of pure gold of considerable thickness and the windows also have golden ornaments so vast indeed are the riches of the palace that it is impossible to convey an idea of them in this island there are pearls also in large quantities of a red pink color rounded shape and of great size equal in value to or even exceeding that of the white pearls it is customary with one part of the inhabitants to bury their dead and with another part to burn them the former have a practice of putting one of these pearls into the mouth of the corpse there are also found there a number of precious stones of so great a celebrity was the wealth of this island that a desire was excited in the breast of the grand khan kublai now reigning to make the conquest of it and to annex it to his dominions in order to effect this fitted out a numerous fleet and embarked a large body of troops under the command of two of his principal officers one of whom was named abakatan the other vonasikin the expedition sailed from the parts of zaitun and kinsay and crossed the intermediate sea reached the island in safety but in consequence of a jealousy that arose between the two commanders one of whom treated the plans of the other with contempt and resisted the execution of his orders they were unable to gain possession of any city or fortified place with the exception of one only which was carried by assault the garrison having refused to surrender directions were given for putting the whole to the sword and in obedience thereto the heads were all cut off excepting of eight persons who by the efficiency of a diabolical charm consisting of a jewel or an amulet introduced into the right arm between the skin and the flesh were rendered secure from the effects of iron either to kill or wound upon this discovery being made they were beaten with a heavy wooden club and presently died it happened after some time that a north wind began to blow with great force and the ships of the tartars which lay near the shore of the island were driven foul of each other it was determined thereupon in a council of the officers on board that they ought to disengage themselves from the land and accordingly as soon as the troops were re-embarked they stood out to sea the gale however increased to so violent a degree that a number of the vessels foundered the people belonging to them by floating upon pieces of the wreck saved themselves upon an island lying about four miles from the coast of zipangu the other ships which not being so near to the land did not suffer from the storm and in which the two chiefs were embarked together with the principal officers or those who rank entitled them to command a hundred thousand or ten thousand men directed their course homewards and returned to the grand khan those of the tartars who remained upon the island where they were wrecked and who amounted to about thirty thousand men find themselves left without shipping abandoned by their leaders and having neither arms nor provisions expected nothing less than to become captives or perish especially as the island afforded no habitations where they could take shelter and refresh themselves 
as soon as the gale ceased and the sea became smooth and calm the people from the main island of zipangu came over with a large force in numerous boats in order to make prisoners of the shipwrecked tartars and having landed proceeded in search of them but in a straggling disorderly manner the tartars on their part acted with prudent circumspicion and being concealed from view by some high land in the centre of the island whilst the enemy was hurrying in pursuit of them by one road made a circuit of the coast by another which brought them to the place where the fleet of boats was at anchor finding these all abandoned but with their colours flying they instantly seized them and pushing off from the island stood for the principal city of zipangu into which from the appearance of the colours they were suffered to enter unmolested here they found few of the inhabitants besides women when the king was surprised of what had taken place he was much afflicted and immediately gave directions for a strict blockade of the city which was so effectual that not any person was suffered to enter or escape from it during the six months that the siege continued at the expiration of this time the tartars despairing of succour surrendered upon the condition of their lives being spared these events took place in the course of the year twelve sixty four the grand khan having learned some years after that the unfortunate issue of the expedition was to be attributed to the dissension between the two commanders caused the head of one of them to be cut off the other he sent to the savage island of zorza where it is the custom to execute criminals in the following manner they are wrapped round both arms in the hide of a buffalo fresh taken from the beast which is sewed tight as this dries it compresses the body to such a degree that the sufferer is incapable of moving or in any manner helping himself and thus miserably perishes end of section ninety six this recording is in the public domain Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 97 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in february two thousand eighteen the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section ninety seven the coming of will adams to japan by will adams will adams was the first englishman to make his home in japan his knowledge of shipbuilding made him so useful to the emperor that, although he was treated with honours and liberality, he was not allowed to leave the country. The Japanese of the street in Yedo, which was named for him, still hold an annual celebration in his memory. The letter from which the following extracts are taken, with modernised spelling, was written in 1611. It begins with his departure from the coast of Peru. The Editor it was agreed that we should leave the coast of peru and direct our course for japan having understood that cloth was good merchandise there and also how upon that coast of peru the king's ships were out seeking us having knowledge of our being there understanding that we were weak of men which was certain for one of our fleet for hunger was forced to seek relief at the enemy's hands in st argo so we stood away directly for japan and passed the equinoctial line together until we came in twenty-eight degrees to the northward of the line in which latitude we were about the twenty-third of february sixteen hundred we had a wondrous storm of wind as ever i was in 
with much rain in which storm we lost our consort whereof we were very sorry nevertheless with hope that in japan we should meet the one the other we proceeded on our former intention for japan and in the height of thirty degrees sought the northernmost cape of the forenamed island but found it not by reason that it lieth false in all cards and maps and globes for the cape lieth in thirty-five degrees and one half which is a great difference in the end in thirty-two degrees and one half we came in sight of the land being the nineteenth day of april so that between the cape of st maria and japan we were four months and twenty-two days at which time there were no more than six besides myself that could stand upon his feet so we in safety let fall our anchor about a league from the place called bungo at which time came to us many boats and we suffered them to come aboard being not able to resist them which people did us no harm neither of us understanding the one the other the king of bungo showed us great friendship for he gave us an house and land where we landed our sick man and had all refreshing that was needful we had when we came to anchor in bungo sick and whole four and twenty men of which number the next day three died the rest for the most part recovered saving three which lay a long time sick and in the end also died in the which time of our being here the emperor hearing of us sent presently five galleys or frigates to us to bring me to the court where his highness was which was distant from bungo about an eighty english leagues so that as soon as i came before him he demanded of me of what country we were so i answered him in all points for there was nothing that he demanded not both concerning war and peace between country and country so that the particulars here to write would be too tedious and for that time i was commanded to prison being well used with one of our mariners that came with me to serve me a two days after the emperor called me again demanding the reason of our coming so far i answered we are a people that sought all friendship with all nations and to have trade in all countries bringing such merchandise as our country did afford into strange lands in the way of traffic he demanded also as concerning the wars between the spaniards or portugal and our country and the reasons the which i gave him to understand of all things which he was glad to hear as it seemed to me in the end i was commanded to prison again but my lodging was bettered in another place so that thirty-nine days i was in prison hearing no more news either of our ship nor captain whether he were recovered of his sickness or not nor of the rest of the company in which time i looked every day to die to be crossed crucified as the custom of justice is in japan as hanging in our land in which long time of imprisonment the jesuits and the portuguese gave many evidences against me and the rest to the emperor that we were thieves and robbers of all nations and where we suffered to live it should be against the profit of his highness and the land for no nation should come there without robbing his highness's justice being executed the rest of our nation without doubt should fear and not come here any more thus daily making access to the emperor and procuring friends to hasten my death but god that is always merciful at need showed mercy unto us and would not suffer them to have their wills of us in the end the emperor gave them answer that we as yet had not done to him nor to none of his land any harm or damage therefore against reason and justice to put us to death if our countries had war the one with the other that was no cause that he should put us to death with which they were out of heart that their cruel pretence failed them for which god be for evermore praised now in this time that i was in prison the ship was commanded to be brought so near to the city where the emperor was as she might be for grounding her the which was done forty-one days being expired the emperor caused me to be brought before him again demanding of me many questions more which were too long to write in conclusion he asked me whether i were desirous to go to the ship to see my countrymen i answered very gladly the which he bade me do 
so I departed and was free from imprisonment. And this was the first news that I had that the ship and company were come to the city. So that with a rejoicing heart I took a boat and went to our ship, where I found the captain and the rest recovered of their sickness, and when I came aboard with weeping eyes was received, for it was given them to understand that I was executed long since. Thus, God be praised, all we that were left alive came together again. From the ship all things were taken out, so that the clothes which I took with me on my back I only had. All my instruments and books were taken. Not only I lost what I had in the ship, but from the captain and the company generally what was good or worth the taking was carried away, all which was done unknown to the emperor. So, in process of time having knowledge of it, he commanded that they which had taken our goods should restore it to us back again, but it was here and there so taken that we could not get it again, saving fifty thousand reals in ready money was commanded to be given us, and in his presence brought and delivered in the hands of one that was made our governor, who kept them in his hands to distribute them unto us as we had need for the buying of victuals for our men with other particular charges. In the end the money was divided according to every man's place, but this was about two years that we had been in Japan, and when we had a denial that we should not have our ship but to abide in Japan. So that the part of every one being divided, every one took his way where he thought best. In the end the emperor gave every man, much as was worth eleven or twelve ducats a year, namely myself, the captain, and mariners all alike. So in process of four or five years the emperor called me as diverse times he had done before. So one time above the rest he would have me to make him a small ship. I answered that I was no carpenter and had no knowledge thereof. Well, do your endeavour, saith he, if it be no good it is no matter. Wherefore at his command I built him a ship of the burden of eighty tons or thereabout, which ship being made in all respects as our manner is, he coming aboard to see it, liked it very well, by which means I came in favour with him, so that I came often in his presence, who from time to time gave me presents, and at length a yearly stipend to live upon much about seventy ducats by the year with two pounds of rice a day daily. Now being in such grace and favour by reason I learned him some points of geometry and understanding of the art of mathematics with other things, I pleased him so that what I said he would not contrary, at which my former enemies did wonder, and at this time must entreat me to do them a friendship which both Spaniards and Portuguese have I done, recompensing them good for evil. So to pass my time to get my living, it hath cost me great labour and trouble at the first, but God hath blessed my labour. In the end of five years I made supplication to the king to go out of this land, desiring to see my poor wife and children according to conscience and nature. With the which request the emperor was not well pleased, and would not let me go any more for my country, but to bide in his land. Yet in process of time being in great favour with the emperor, I made supplications again, by reason we had news that the Hollanders were in Xi'an and Patania, which rejoiced us much with hope that God should bring us to our country again by one means or other. So I made supplication again, and boldly spoke myself with him, at which he gave me no answer. I told him if he would permit me to depart, I would be a means that both the English and Hollanders should come and traffic there. But by no means he would let me go. I asked him leave for the captain, the which he presently granted me. So by that means my captain got leave, and in a Japan junk sailed to Patan, and in a year's space came no Hollanders. In the end he went from Patan to Eor, where he found a fleet of nine sail, of which fleet Matleaf was general, and in this fleet he was made master again, which fleet sailed to Malacca, and fought with an armado of Portugal, in which battle he was shot and presently died, so that, as I think, no certain news is known whether I be living or dead. 
therefore i do pray and entreat you in the name of jesus christ to do so much as to make my being here in japan known to my poor wife in a manner a widow and my two children fatherless which thing only is my greatest grief of heart and conscience i am a man not unknown in radcliffe and limehouse by name to my good master nicholas diggins and mr thomas best and mr nicholas isaac and william isaac brothers with many others also to mr william jones and mr beckett therefore may this letter come to any of their hands or the copy i do know that compassion and mercy is so that my friends and kindred shall have news that i do as yet live in this vale of my sorrowful pilgrimage the which thing again and again i do desire for jesus christ his sake End of section 97。section 98 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Avai in January 2018。the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section ninety eight long spears or short spears by walter denning the tokichi of this story is the famous japanese general hideyoshi the editor once it happened that nobunaga gave a feast to his chief retainers and in the course of conversation spoke as follows weapons of war have changed from age to age in very ancient times bows and arrows were all the fashion then spears and swords came into use and recently guns are all the rage these weapons all have their advantages but i intend to make the spear the weapon on which to rely in battle now as you know there are some who advocate the use of long spears and others who prefer short ones i should like to hear what you mr mondo have to say on this point mondo in a most pompous manner commenced thus to state his opinion to me it seems there can be no difference of opinion as to short spears being preferable to long ones when thrust into an opponent's body they enter with great strength when flourished about in self-defence they can be moved rapidly and when an enemy comes to close quarters whereas nothing can be done with a long spear a short one can be wielded at will that weapon which can be moved about with the greatest freedom to suit the exigencies of the occasion is surely the best in my idea therefore no spear should be longer than eight feet nobunaga being in the habit of using a spear about eighteen feet long felt disconcerted as he listened to these remarks but since they proceeded from the lips of a professor of the art of spear exercise in his own employ he did not care to reply to them in person looking around he saw tokichi hideyoshi coming in and without telling him what had happened turned to him and said ah tokichi come here which is to be preferred a long spear or a short one why ask me such a question replied tokichi then pointing to mondo he continued here is a man who is versed in these matters consult him no no replied nobunaga today every one is to give his opinion on the subject so just say what you think will you well then replied tokichi i will long spears are the better of course what are you talking about exclaimed mondo burning with rage am i not employed by lord oda nobunaga for the special purpose of giving instruction in spear exercise and have i not decided that short spears are the better you have the audacity to assert the opposite i don't suppose you know anything about the matter but if you do i should like to know your reasons for the assertion you have made i do not pretend to be versed in the matter replied tokichi 
but as i was commanded by the baron to say what i think and since i am decidedly of the opinion that long spears are the better surely i am not to be blamed for saying so without waiting for him to finish his reply mondo who was growing more and more angry came close to him and pushing him as he spoke again asked what is your reason for saying that long spears are the better all i know is that a long spear reaches a long way and therefore is better than a short one replied tokichi you cannot decide the matter in this summary manner replied mondo you should not talk such nonsense in the presence of the baron please in future be more careful what you say was i not commanded by lord oda to speak my mind on the subject asked tokichi you cannot have every one thinking alike on such matters you hold that short spears are the best but other persons are evidently of a different opinion or there would be no long spears used in the country for a man that professes to be a teacher of spear exercise to take such a narrow view of things is extremely absurd having had experience in the matter replied mondo i speak as one that knows and i am not theorizing like you here nobunaga interposed you two may go on forever like this without settling anything suppose we put the matter to a practical test do you each take command of fifty soldiers and for three days let them be instructed in the use of your respective spears after which you shall all meet and fence and we will see who gets the best of it the leaders agreed but none of the soldiers wished to belong to tokichi's side what does he know about spear exercise said they of course he will be beaten nobunaga seeing this commanded that lots be drawn and that the men on whom the lots fell should fence on tokichi's side mondo was much pleased with the arrangement made we shall soon see what this fellow's theories are worth said he he instructed his fifty men day by day telling them how to turn aside the thrusts of their foes and how to get into close quarters with them and render their long spears useless but they being novices at the art made little progress mondo seeing this grew very angry with them and mingling blows with abuse tried to frighten them into acquiring the art but all to no purpose they became utterly sick of the whole thing and did nothing but complain of their ill luck in being chosen to fight on mondo's side tokichi gathered his men together and addressed them as follows we have been commanded by our lord to try whether long spears are not better than short ones by fencing with mondo and his men as nobunaga is of opinion that long spears are the better and i think so too of course we shall conquer if you do not know already it is impossible that in the space of three days you can learn how to use a spear so what you would better do is to make up your minds that you will fight together provided you obey orders and keep together you may use your spears any way you please dash at mondo's men and hit them about anyhow and they will give in as today is the first day of our preparation for war we should better propitiate hachiman by making some offerings to him here tokichi caused food and sake to be presented to hachiman these he afterwards took and handed around to his men who after having thoroughly regaled themselves went home thinking that their leader was a very jolly fellow the next day tokichi divided his men into three bands consisting of two bands of sixteen men each which were to approach the enemy from the right and another of eighteen men which was to advance from the centre i will give the word of command said he do you all obey orders promptly he then feasted them again and after praising them for the attention which they had paid to what he had said sent them home the next day he spent a short time in ordering them about they obeyed his commands with great promptness so after giving them another good meal he said to-morrow is the day of trial remember you are to make up your minds not to be beaten 
no fear they replied those fellows won't stand a chance before us while on their way home at sunset they fell in with mondo's men well how are you getting on they inquired mondo's men all began to grumble we have only just finished our drill said they from morning to night every day we have been at it mondo hardly gives us time to get our lunch we are utterly worn out with fatigue and hunger and our limbs are stiff with using the spear how it will fare with us to-morrow goodness knows we are in no condition to fight a hard life of it we warriors have to pass sure enough the next day tokichi reported to nobunaga that his men had been duly trained and he was prepared to meet mondo and his party nobunaga had great confidence in tokichi's superior intelligence and felt sure that by some means or other he would outwit mondo so he gave orders for the preparation of a large fencing ring and decided that the match should take place that same day the contest commenced in the customary way the sound of the drum being the signal for the onset to begin at the command of tokichi the eighteen men appointed to face the central part of the enemy's force advanced with spirit and all together mondo's men had not been drilled to combined effort and so when they were suddenly set upon by these eighteen men they lost their heads and while they were in a state of confusion tokichi commanded the right and left wings to advance to the attack which being done all mondo's men were driven from the position they had occupied while this was going on mondo was engaged in giving orders to individual men as to how they were to ward off the blows of their opponents but as they knew nothing of the art of fencing and were bewildered by the combined attack of their foes his commands were not obeyed while he was considering what to do the drum sounded for the fight to cease mondo overcome with remorse begged nobunaga to allow him to try a second time tokichi on being consulted as to this said certainly there is no saying how many times one may have to fight an enemy i am ready to fight any number of times on the renewal of the contest mondo encountered another defeat and this time tokichi by a stratagem surrounded all his opponent's men so that they could not move forward or back nobunaga seeing the skill with which tokichi gave orders determined to employ him as one of his generals the fencing being over nobunaga called mondo and tokichi and addressed them as follows the contest you have had to-day has been no real test as to which spear is the better the long or the short one as tokichi is skilful in manoeuvring troops he has come off victorious if the contest had depended on mondo's use of the spear of course it would have been otherwise all that has happened has been a fight between a number of unskilful men so you two have no reason for bearing any ill will to each other here they returned to their homes mondo's angry feelings had been somewhat appeased by nobunaga's remarks but he still thought that tokichi ought to be humbled in some way or other so knowing that sakuma and shibata two of nobunaga's chief vassals looked with envious eyes on tokichi's rapid promotion he determined to unite with them in concocting something that would tend to lower tokichi in the eyes of his master in the meanwhile tokichi's suspicions in reference to mondo began to be aroused he bore in mind mondo's assertion that he had come from chugoku but to tokichi his language and manners appeared unlike those of a man who had come from a distant province might he not be a spy from some neighboring enemy of nobunaga in order to find out who he was tokichi summoned from his native village of nakamura a man called yasuke him he ordered to become mondo's servant and to watch his movements closely while this was taking place mondo sakuma and shibata were consulting together as to how they should get rid of tokichi mondo suggested that as there had been a controversy about the spears and subsequently a match to test their merits he should ask nobunaga to allow him and tokichi to have a fencing match and then said he 
during the match I will kill him. This plan met with the approval of the other two. Nobunaga, being asked to allow the match to be held, called Tokichi and consulted him about it. Tokichi immediately accepted Mondo's challenge. Before the fencing commenced, they each agreed that whoever was defeated should become the servant of the victor. Mondo, though confident of victory, was no match for Tokichi, who was extremely proficient in all the military arts of those days. Overcome with shame, Mondo bowed his head and offered to become his adversary's servant. According to the agreement made, Mondo, interposed Nobunaga, you are to become Tokichi's follower, and see to it that you bear no malice in your heart on this account. Tokichi bade Mondo come to his house that evening, saying that he had something he wished to say to him. On his arrival, Tokichi spoke to him as follows. My getting the best of the contest today is something that I never expected. I hope that you will not on this account harbor any ill feelings toward me. Although an ignorant man, I have intelligence enough to see that in most matters you are extremely shrewd, and that your skill in the art you profess is very considerable. I am anxious that your powers should be employed in effecting what is good, and not what is bad. My saying today that you should become my servant was not said in pride. My object in making you a servant was that I might have an opportunity of correcting what is wrong in you. As I am thus dealing honestly with you and telling you the real truth, I trust that you will hide nothing from me. You are not from Chugoku, but are no other than a spy of Saito, sent here to watch for an opportunity of killing Nobunaga. Tokichi now produced the letter which Yasuke had seized that contained a clear reference to the plot, and then continued. And this you deem acting faithfully to your master, do you? You may call it loyalty, but it is a loyalty which should not be practiced. Without asking whether a master is virtuous or not, a fool or a wise man, obedient to the laws or not, to expend effort in furthering this course is the height of folly. You may get a kind of reputation by doing this, but what is it worth? Mondo was utterly taken aback by these revelations, and did not know what to say in reply. After thinking over the matter a little, this man is too much for me, he said to himself. He outwits me in everything. Even my plot against Nobunaga has not escaped his notice. Then, turning to Tokichi, he exclaimed, You astound me by your sharpness. It is as you say, and as my contemplated crime is discovered, please do cut off my head and take it to Nobunaga. Nobunaga has no wish to kill you, or he would have done it before, replied Tokichi. You are serving a wicked master, a man who has been guilty of parenticide, and this being so, in serving him you are offending against heaven. Your life Nobunaga does not seek, but your reform he does. If you will give up serving this wicked man and enlist in the service of Lord Oda, then I have orders from him to deal leniently with you. Mondo, still more impressed by this treatment, agreed to follow Tokichi the rest of his days. Whereupon Tokichi took Mondo to Nobunaga and told him what had happened, and Mondo swore fealty to his new master. Being thoroughly acquainted with Saito's affairs, subsequently, when Nobunaga made war on that baron, he rendered him great assistance. Here again Tokichi displayed that magnanimity which distinguished his whole career. And the testing of the spears proved to be the means of revealing the respective characters of the two men that wielded them. End of section 98「Section number 99 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, 
vancouver b c the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section number ninety nine how a man became a god by lafcadio hearn before telling the story of hamaguchi gohi i must say a few words about certain laws or more correctly speaking customs having all the force of laws by which many village communities were ruled in pre-meji times these customs were based upon the societal experience of ages and though they differ in minor details according to province or district their main signification was everywhere about the same some were ethical some industrial some religious and all matters were regulated by them even individual behavior they preserved peace and they compelled mutual help and mutual kindness sometimes there might be serious fighting between different villages little peasant wars about questions of water supply or boundaries but quarrelling between men of the same community could not be tolerated in an age of vendetta and the whole village would resent any needless disturbance of the internal peace to some degree this state of things still exists in the more old-fashioned provinces the people know how to live without quarrelling not to say fighting anywhere as a general rule japanese fight only to kill and when a sober man goes so far as to strike a blow he virtually rejects communal protection and takes his life into his own hands with every probability of losing it the obligation of mutual help in time of calamity or danger was the most imperative of all communal obligations in case of fire especially everybody was required to give immediate aid to the best of his or her ability even children were not exempted from this duty in towns and cities of course things were differently ordered but in any little country village the universal duty was very plain and simple and its neglect would have been considered unpardonable a curious fact is that this obligation of mutual help extended to religious matters everybody was expected to invoke the help of the gods for the sick or the unfortunate whenever asked to do so for example the village might be ordered to make a sendo mari on behalf of some one seriously ill footnote to perform a sendo mari means to make one thousand visits to a temple and to repeat one thousand invocations to the deity but it is considered necessary only to go from the gate or the tori of the temple court to the place of prayer and back one thousand times repeating the invocation each time and the task may be divided upon any number of persons ten visits by one hundred persons for instance being quite as efficacious as a thousand visits by a single person End footnote. on such occasions the kumi cho each kumi cho was responsible for the conduct of five or more families would run from house to house crying such and such a one is very sick kindly hasten all to make a sendo mari thereupon however occupied at the moment every soul in the settlement was expected to hurry to the temple taking care not to trip or stumble on the way as a single misstep during the performance of a sendo mari was believed to mean misfortune for the sick now concerning hamaguchi from imma 
immemorial time the shores of japan have been swept at irregular intervals of centuries by enormous tidal waves tidal waves caused by earthquakes or by submarine volcanic action these awful sudden risings of the sea are called by the japanese tsunami the last one occurred on the evening of june seventeenth eighteen ninety six when a wave nearly two hundred miles long struck the northeastern provinces of miyagi iwati and omori wrecking scores of towns and villages ruining whole districts and destroying nearly thirty thousand human lives the story of hamaguchi gohi is the story of a like calamity which happened long before the era of meiji on another part of the japanese coast he was an old man at the time of the occurrence that made him famous he was the most influential resident of the village to which he belonged he had been for many years its morosa or head man and he was not less liked than respected the people usually called him ojiasen which means grandfather but being the richest member of the community he was sometimes officially re referred to as the choja he used to advise the smaller farmers about their interests to arbitrate their disputes to advance them money at need and to dispose of their rice for them on the best terms possible hamaguchi's big thatched farmhouse stood at the verge of a small plateau overlooking a bay the plateau mostly devoted to rice culture was hemmed in on three sides by thickly wooded summits from its outer verge the land sloped down in a huge green concavity as if scooped out to the edge of the water and the whole of this slope some three-quarters of a mile long was so terraced as to look when viewed from the open sea like an enormous flight of green steps divided in the centre by a narrow white zigzag a streak of mountain road ninety thatched dwellings and a shinto temple composing the village proper stood along the curve of the bay and other houses climbed straggling up the slope for some distance on either side of the narrow road leading to the choja's home one autumn evening hamaguchi gohi was looking down from the balcony of his house at some preparations for a merry-making in the village below there had been a very fine rice crop and the peasants were going to celebrate their harvest by a dance in the court of the ujigami footnote shinto parish temple End of footnote the old man could see the festival banners nobori fluttering above the roofs of the solitary street the strings of paper lanterns festooned between bamboo poles the decorations of the shrine and the brightly colored gathering of the young people he had nobody with him that evening but his little grandson a lad of ten the rest of the household have gone early to the village he would have accompanied them had he not been feeling less strong than usual the day had been oppressive and in spite of a rising breeze there was still in the air that sort of heavy heat which according to the experience of the japanese peasant at certain seasons precedes an earthquake and presently an earthquake came it was not strong enough to frighten anybody but hamaguchi who had felt hundreds of shocks in his time thought it queer a long slow spongy motion probably it was but the after tremor of some immense seismic action very far away 
the house crackled and rocked gently several times then all became still again as the quaking ceased hamaguchi's keen old eyes were anxiously turned toward the village it often happens that the attention of a person gazing fixedly at a particular spot or object is suddenly diverted by the sense of something not knowingly seen at all by a mere vague feeling of the unfamiliar in that dim outer circle of unconscious perception which lies beyond the field of clear vision thus it chanced that hamaguchi became aware of something unusual in the offing he rose to his feet and looked at the sea it had darkened quite suddenly and it was acting strangely it seemed to be moving against the wind it was running away from the land within a very little time the whole village had noticed the phenomenon apparently no one had felt the previous motion of the ground but all were evidently astounded by the movement of the water they were running to the beach and even beyond the beach to watch it no such ebb had been witnessed on that coast within the memory of living man things never seen before were making apparition unfamiliar spaces of ribbed sand and reaches of weed hung rock were left bare even as hamaguchi gazed and none of the people below appeared to guess what that monstrous ebb signified hamaguchi gohi himself had never seen such a thing before but he remembered things told him in his childhood by his father's father and knew all the traditions of the coast he understood what the sea was going to do perhaps he thought of the time needed to send a message to the village or to get the priests of the buddhist temple on the hill to sound their big bell but it would take very much longer to tell what he might have thought that it took him to think he simply called to his grandson tada quick very quick light me a torch tamimasu or pine torches are kept in many coast dwellings to use on stormy nights and also for use at certain shinto festivals the child kindled a torch at once and the old man hurried with it to the fields where hundreds of rice stacks representing most of his invested capital stood awaiting transportation approaching those nearest the verge of the slope he began to apply this torch to them hurrying from one to another as quickly as his aged limbs could carry him the sun-dried stalks caught like tinder the strengthening sea breeze blew the blaze landward and presently rank behind the rank the stacks burst into flame sending skyward columns of smoke that met and mingled into one enormous cloudy whirl tada astonished and terrified ran after his grandfather crying oji san why oji san why why but hamaguchi did not answer he had no time to explain he was thinking only of the four hundred lives in peril for a while the child stared wildly at the blazing rice then burst into tears and ran back to the house feeling sure that his grandfather had gone mad hamaguchi went on firing stack after stack till he had reached the limit of his field then he threw down his torch and waited the acolyte of the hill temple observing the blaze set the big bell booming and the people responded to the double appeal hamaguchi watched them hurrying in from the sands and over the beach and up from the village like a swarming of ants and to his anxious eyes scarcely faster for the moment seemed terribly long to him the sun was going down the wrinkled bed of the bay and a fast sallow speckled expanse beyond it 
lay naked to the last orange glow, and still the sea was fleeing toward the horizon. Really, however, Hamaguchi did not have very long to wait before the first party of succor arrived. A score of agile young peasants, who wanted to attack the fire at once, but the Choja, holding out both arms, stopped them. Let it burn, lads, he commanded. Let it be. I want the whole Mura here. There is great danger. Tahenda. The whole village was coming, and Hamaguchi counted. All the young men and boys were soon on the spot, and not a few of the more active women and girls. Then came most of the older folk, and mothers with babies at their backs, and even children, for children could help to pass water, and the elders too feeble to keep up with the first rush could be seen well on their way up the steep ascent. The growing multitude, still knowing nothing, looked alternately, in sorrowful wonder, at the flaming fields and at the impassive face of their choja and the sun went down grandfather is mad i am afraid of him sobbed tada in answer to a number of questions he is mad he set fire to the rice on purpose i saw him do it as for the rice cried hamaguchi the child tells the truth i set fire to the rice are all the people here the kimi cho and the heads of families looked about them and down the hill and made reply all are here or very soon will be we cannot understand this thing kita shouted the old man at the top of his voice pointing to the open say now if i be mad through the twilight eastward all looked and saw at the edge of the dusky horizon a long lean dim line like the shadowing of a coast where no coast ever was a line that thickened as they gazed that broadened as a coastline broadens to the eyes of one approaching it yet incomparably more quickly for that long darkness was the returning sea towering like a cliff and coursing more swiftly than the kite flies tsunami shrieked the people and then all shrieks and all sounds and all power to hear sounds were annihilated by a nameless shock heavier than any thunder as the colossal swell smote the shore with a weight that sent a shudder through the hills and with a foam burst like a blaze of sheet lightning then for an instant nothing was visible but a storm of spray rushing up the slope like a cloud and the people scattered back in panic from the mere menace of it when they looked again they saw a white horror of sea raving over the place of their homes it drew back roaring and tearing out the bowels of the land as it went twice thrice five times the sea struck and ebbed but each time with lesser surges then it returned to its ancient bed and stayed still raging as after a typhoon on the plateau for a time there was no word spoken all stared speechlessly at the desolation beneath the ghastliness of hurled rock and naked riven cliff the bewilderment of scooped up deep sea rack and shingle shot over the empty site of dwelling and temple the village was not the greater part of the fields were not even the terraces had ceased to exist and of all the homes that had been about the bay there remained nothing recognizable except two straw roofs tossing madly in the offing the after-terror of the death escaped and 
the stupefaction of the general loss kept all lips dumb until the voice of hamaguchi was heard again observing gently that was why i set fire to the race here their choja now stood among them almost as poor as the poorest for his wealth was gone but he had saved four hundred lives by the sacrifice little tada ran to him and caught his hand and asked forgiveness for having said naughty things whereupon the people woke up to the knowledge of why they were alive and began to wonder at the simple unselfish foresight that had saved them and the headmen prostrated themselves in the dust before hamaguchi gohi and the people after them then the old man wept a little partly because he was happy and partly because he was aged and weak and had been sorely tired my host remains he said as soon as he could find words automatically caressing tada's brown cheeks and there is room for many also the temple on the hill stands and there is shelter there for the others then he led the way to his house and the people cried and shouted the period of distress was long because in those days there were no means of quick communication between the district and district and the help needed had to be sent from far away but when better times came the people did not forget their debt to hamaguchi gohi they could not make him rich nor would he have suffered them to do so even had it been possible moreover gifts could not have sufficed as an expression of their reverential feeling towards him for they believed that the ghost within him was divine so they declared him a god and therefore called him amaguchi daimujin thinking they could give him no greater honor and truly no greater honor in any country could be given to a mortal man and when they rebuilt the village they built a temple to the spirit of him and fixed about the front of it a tablet bearing the name in chinese text of gold and they worshipped him there with prayer and with offerings how he felt about it i cannot say i know only that he continued to live in his old thatched home upon the hill with his children and his children's children just as humanly and simply as before while his soul was being worshipped in the shrine below a hundred years and more he has been dead but his temple they tell me still stands and the people still pray to the ghost of the good old farmer to help them in times of fear or trouble end of section ninety nine this recording is in the public domain Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.